Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Wise as a Serpent. We are talking with Dr. Price, Dr. Robert M. Price, the sage himself. Uh, hi, this is uh, an interesting topic to me. Uh, does the Bible really condemn homosexuality? Uh, and uh, this is because I've had friends who are gay and Christian and they feel guilty and what the heck am I doing? And uh, it, But it, even just as a matter of what does the Bible say, it always uh, intrigued me. And so I've done a whole mess of reading on this for years and that doesn't mean uh, I must be right in what I say, right? That's, uh, but uh, this is at least one informed view. And um, basically what this entails is uh, going through uh, several Bible passages and you probably already know the ones I mean and I've got to also preface it by saying that the the, uh, the uh, scrutiny here uh, is partly a matter of exegesis as they call it and uh, partly of hermeneutics what the heck is that I'm not speaking in tongues but uh, uh, the exegesis just means you're trying to figure out what the gr underlying Greek text meant uh, just grammatically and uh, the lexically what the the words meant and how we know uh, what what uh, customs are presupposed if there's any way to, to deduce that and often there is uh, and and so forth and what did the writer intend there are other ways of uh, reading the Bible and trying to get something out of it uh, many but what we're interested in here is like what were the Bible writers thinking and saying and the hermeneutics so it comes from uh, Hermes the interpreting God and hermeneutics is more of a uh, second order uh, approach you're asking about the implications uh, for the reader of the uh, the, the text and uh, this usually this is brought up in the context of biblical authority right where people feel uh, bound uh, to do what the Bible says to do and abstain from the things the Bible uh, condemns now I, I don't happen to hold that uh, view anymore I haven't for years uh, but I know that is what's at stake for a lot of people uh, whether they uh, want to obey the Bible or attack it if they disagree with it uh, uh, so either way, it, it, I think you, you need to, to uh, be alert to the implications here. What's it actually saying, and uh, what does that mean for people who take it seriously? Well, I'd like to, to start with uh, the granddaddy of them all, the, the uh, story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, it, I always think of this uh, song from this cheesy sort of uh, evangelical counterpoint to Jesus Christ Superstar. I'm sure you never heard of it, but it's a uh, it's like a rock opera thing called uh, Truth of Truths, and there's <laughs> some the music is pretty funny but fun to listen to and uh, one of the uh, songs early on is uh, about Sodom and Gomorrah it's it's really funny the angels are singing uh, Sodom and Gomorrah they're the cities of sin the Lord has sent us to destroy them I mean it's really funny you can picture this on Dick Clark or something but uh, what is the deal with that uh, of course everybody always says well God uh, condemns homosexuality he blasted uh, both of those cities uh, because uh, they were rife with uh, sodomy and homosexuality and so forth. And uh, therefore, homosexuality has to be wrong if you're looking at it through the, the lenses of the Bible. Well, uh, I, I used to assume that, uh, that, you know, even when I didn't think I was duty bound to uh, agree with the Bible, but I, I still assumed that was the point. And I knew that some um, biblical scholars said, well, no, uh, that's not it. The, the story is not about homosexuality. And I thought, what? How can you, you must be twist in the text? Uh, uh, of course, it's about that. But then I started reading more in depth about what these scholars had to say, and uh, in the end, I thought, "Son of a gun, they're right." 
uh, I've been just taking for granted what I always heard, but looking at it in some depth, it looks a whole lot different. So uh, let's uh, take a look at um, the uh, the story in Genesis uh, 19. I believe I've got the bookmark in the right place. Uh, and uh, see, you'll, you'll uh, see why I always say I find the Bible endlessly fascinating is to crack the code like this. Okay, um, this is 19.1. Oh, no, uh, 18. Um, yeah, these... Uh, these three guys show up to Abraham's campfire, and uh, he doesn't know him from Adam, and but he wants to uh, be hospitable to him. That was a, one of the big, big uh, virtues in the ancient world when you didn't have like holiday inns or Marriotts and all, you know, every ten feet. Uh, it, it was. Uh, pretty uh, rough and tumble back then uh, you if you refused hospitality to a wanderer you could be condemning them to starve to death uh, or you left them at the mercy of uh, highwaymen so you really were obliged to give hospitality and shelter if you could at all do so and so the the text is saying what a great guy abraham was uh, the um uh th let's see yeah, um, verse 16, chapter 18, verse 16. The men set out from there, and they looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. Uh, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him? No, for I have chosen him, or literally I have known him, that he may charge his children and household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Uh, and so on. Uh, verse 20 the Lord said to Abraham, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry which has come to me, and if not, I will know. So this is, you know, they're, they're not thinking of an omniscient God here, uh, right? He's got to gotta have a reconnaissance mission, right? And uh, this is obviously uh, ancient uh, theology if you want to call it that. Okay, uh, verse 22. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou indeed destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou then destroy the place and not spare it for fifty righteous for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from thee to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And this is going better than Abe expected. Uh, 27, Abraham answered, Behold, I, I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Uh, as suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Wilt thou then destroy the whole city for a lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Uh, again, he spoke to him and said, <laughs> uh, Suppose 40 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Uh, suppose uh, <laughs> 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, uh, behold, I've taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Uh, suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Um, then uh, Abraham said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. Um, uh, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way, and when he had finished speaking to, to, to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Well, what happens, folks? Uh, in chapter 19, 
the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. By the way, that implies he had attained a position as an elder of the city, um, because that's where cases were heard in the shade of the the opening, uh, uh, the gates of the wall of the city. Okay, when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, turn aside, I pray you, to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Uh, Because, you know, sandals, your feet must be caked with dirt after your journey. Uh, They said, uh, no, we will spend the night in the street. But he urged them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. In other words, he's just like his uncle Abraham. He doesn't know who these guys are, but it doesn't matter. They're they're lone travelers and he needs to take care of them, right? Okay, uh, verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out of the door to the ho- to the men, shut the door after him, and said, I-, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Uh, behold, I-, I have two daughters who have not known man. Let me bring them out to you, and do to them as you please. Only do not stand, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn and he would play the judge? I mean, he's a foreigner, right? And he, he's telling us what to do. Uh, now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door. But the men, the angels, put forth their hands and brought Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves groping for the door. Now, where's that door? I saw it a minute ago. Uh, then the men said to Lot, uh, the two angels, have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have at the city, bring them out of the place, uh, be, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. Um, uh, there's uh, there's more to it, uh, but but he does pretty much nuke the place. And, and you see what's going on here. God, who who we have to assume, knew what was going to happen. Uh, he, he was pretty sure all those rumors were true. And he says, oh, uh, you you think uh, 50 is uh, you know too many to destroy the whole? Well, sure, okay, let's negotiate. What, 45? Yeah, sure, why not? 40, 35, 20. Five. Hey, what the heck? All right, you know, well, let's let's go with that figure. And so he figures. Well, Abraham figures. Whew, I guess I just uh, saved those guys' butts. Uh, but uh, no, uh, the text says that there wasn't a single resident of Sodom who didn't pound on the door, uh, asking for those men. The whole town was a nasty mob. Now, what was it they were planning to do? It says, bring them out that we may know them. Well, because uh, ten times in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for to know um, has the implication of to have carnal knowledge, to have sex with, right? Uh, Like... uh, Genesis 4:1. Uh, Adam knew his wife, and uh, brought she brought forth his son Cain. Right, he knew her sexually. Right. Well, people have gratuitously thought, oh yeah, that's what the uh, the Sodom mob wanted to do. They wanted to gang rape these guys. Now, that strikes me as utterly bizarre, now that I read it without the glasses of fundamentalism, uh, because it it 
seems to mean just on the face of it without reading anything into it that they just wanted to have strangers here we, we want to have a look at these guys and in fact the ancient rabbis understood that they wanted to rob and kill these guys because they had a story uh that kind of explains this that there was that they said that in sodom uh, the, the great wickedness that everybody knew, uh, unless you were a naive traveler, traveler was that uh, you better watch your back because these people hate strangers. They're xenophobes. Uh, and uh, so you see, they're just the opposite of, uh, of Abraham and Lot, right? That's the contrast the writer is building up. Abe and Lot were, they didn't care who it was. You need a place to stay for the night? Come on in. Uh, are you hungry? We'll feed you. That's what you ought to be like. But these guys, no, they take advantage of the vulnerability of uh, travelers. And so, uh, the and in the rabbinic story, they gave examples of what the men of Sodom would do to, to foreigners. Uh, they would, uh, you ever heard the, the legend uh, of, uh, of um, uh, the bed of Procrustes? It's a story about uh, Theseus, a uh, great hero of the myths. Mm. Uh, he uh, he um, learns about this guy Procrustes, who is an innkeeper, and he uh, he takes advantage of strangers. They come in, yeah, I gotta have a room for the night. Okay, come right this way, and he uh, he says, "Here's your room," and the 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 person will say, "Wait a minute, I I'm too tall for this bed. This is like a kid's bed. I I can't do lie down in this full length." And he's, "Oh, sure you can. Look," and he shows how the the foot board and the headboard both have holes sawed in them and uh, just uh you know stick your feet out of the holes and you'll sleep like a baby no problem well okay if you say so well Procrustes listens outside the room until uh, he hears the snoring, and then he takes out the hacksaw and uh, starts uh, attacking and dismembering the uh, unsuspecting guest and robs him. Uh, and that's what the rabbis said the men of Sodom would do any time they got a hold of a stranger. You notice what's conspicuously absent from that version of the story Nothing about sex, nothing about raping the, uh, the, the visitors, right? Uh, and uh, so it, now the reason people thought so, that it did, was the fact that a lot tries to buy off the, the raving mob uh, by saying, look, I, I got something else that would be a lot more fun for you here. Why don't you uh, do whatever you want with my <laughs> virgin daughters? What the hell? You might think, what, what is he? Is this, he supposed to be the good guy? Well, oddly enough, it seemed though it's abominable to us and we would never do this. It sort of does make sense in terms of the ancient, uh, I should say, primitive mores of the day because hospitality was so vitally important. Lot is being depicted as someone who would make the ultimate sacrifice not to betray the people he's given shelter to. And if it means his daughters are uh, horribly treated, oh God, that's terrible, but what can I do? I've, I've given my word to these guys. I mean, again, it sounds ridiculous and horrific to us, but I don't think it would have to, to the ancients. Uh, not all of them, anyway. I mean, you know, some hundreds of years later, the uh, the uh, rabbis had this other version, but that's how they read it. That's what they thought was going on. Uh, and uh, also, to, to buttress that, if you turn over to a very similar story in the book of Judges, uh, verse, uh, uh, chapter, I think it is, 19. Oh, have I got it here? Uh, yeah, I sure do. And if I can just get my glasses on again. Uh, give a listen to this one, and and you can tell that it's it's so close. It sounds like an alternate version of the same story, uh, that just that somebody couldn't quite keep straight who the main characters were, uh, and uh, just uh, filled the gap with his imagination. Uh, 
boy, these thin Bible pages. What a nuisance. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, listen to this one. Uh, in those days, this is 1901, in those days when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was so sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem and Judah. And his concubine became angry with him, and she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem and Judah. And there uh, arose... Oh, uh, and, and was there for some four months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of asses. Uh, of course, he means donkeys. I don't know why they keep this translation. Uh, and he came uh, to her father's house, and when the girl's father saw him, he came with joy to meet him. And his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him three days. So they they ate and drank and lodged there. I guess I should say like a concubine was a sort of a common law wife. Uh, it, she had legal status, but wasn't technically married to him. So anyway, uh, this guy He's basically her, his father-in-law. Okay, um, uh, they ate and drank and uh, lodged there. And on the fourth day, they arose early in the morning, and he prepared to go. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, Strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread, and after that you may go. So the two men sat and ate and drank together, and the girl's father said to the man, be pleased to spend the night and let your heart be merry. And when the man rose up to go, his father-in-law urged him till he lodged there again. And on the fifth day, he arose early in the morning uh, and uh, uh, to depart. And the girl's father said, Strengthen your heart and tarry until the day declines. So they ate, both of them. And when the man and his concubine and his servant rose up to depart, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Behold, now the day has waned toward evening. Pray tarry all night. Behold, the day draws to its uh, close. Lodge here and let your heart be merry. And tomorrow you shall arise early in the morning for your journey and go home. Uh, but the man would not spend uh, uh, the night. Let's see here. I. Uh, uh, he rose up and departed and arrived opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. Uh, that was its name before David. Uh, he had with him a couple of saddled asses, and his concubine was with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was far spent, and the servant said to his master, Come now, let us turn aside to this city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. And his master said to him, We will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. And he said to his servant, Come and let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or at uh, Ramah. So they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, and they turned aside there to go in and spend the night in Gibeah. And he went in and sat down in the open square of the city, for no man took, him in, took them into his house to spend the night. And behold, an old man was coming from his work in the field at evening. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was sojourning in Gibeah. And the men of the place were Benjaminites, you know, just like the Levite. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the wayfarer in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going and whence do you come? And he said to him, we're passing from Bethlehem um, in Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim from which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judah and I'm going to my home and nobody takes me into his house. Uh, we have straw and provender for our asses with bread and wine for me and your maidservant or the young man with your servants. There's no lack of anything. And the old man said, Peace be to you. I will care for all your wants. Only do not spend the night in the square. So he brought him to his house and gave the asses provender and they washed their feet and ate and drank. And as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the town, base fellows, beset the house round about 
beating on the door, and they said to the old man, the master of the house, Bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. And the man, uh, the master of the house, went out to them and said, No, my brethren, do not act so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into my house. Um, it, uh, do not do this vile thing. And behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Ravish them and do with them what you what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do so vile a thing. But the man would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine um, and put her out to them. And they knew her, and you know what that means in this instance, and abused her all night until the morning. And as the town, as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. And her master rose up in the morning, and when he opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way, behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold he said to her get up let us be going and it is unbelievable this guy uh, but there was no answer then he put her upon the ass and the man rose up and went away to his home and when he entered his house oh <laughs> get this um he uh took a knife and laying hold of his concubine he divided her limb by limb into 12 Pieces and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And all who saw it said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt till, till this day. Consider it, take counsel and speak. Well, then they have a war council and they bring this guy in and ask him, now tell us exactly what happened. And uh, chapter 20, verse 4 and the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came to Gibeah that belongs to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to spend the night. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about me by night. They meant to kill me, and they ravished my concubine, and she is dead. Well, then they they uh, whoop up a war of vengeance against uh, Hamas, I mean against uh, Gibeah, and uh, and and uh, so on and so on. But the the important thing is, it exactly parallels the Sodom and Gomorrah story, uh, with uh, sl slight irrelevant differences. Uh, the uh, there are the. Um, uh, there, there's the angry mob who wants to see the foreigner who's taken refuge with this guy who also, like Lot, is a foreigner to them, but lives among them. And uh, they, they, uh, he refuses to, to do that. They uh, uh, threaten him and surround the house and, and so forth. And he does uh, give the, the woman to, to them, to mollify them, like Lot offered to. Uh, and uh, what was it they had intended to do to him? Right? It, it, the way you most people take the Sodom and Gomorrah story, they say, well, they must have been a gang of gay rapists, too, and, and so forth. But no, though they raped the, uh, the woman to death, this is something you wouldn't expect if they were gay, right? If they're male homosexuals. And, and the guy, uh, when he recounts the story uh, to, uh, to the war council, he says, they were hoping to kill me. Well, I don't know about you, but the, the large scale parallel between the two stories uh, would imply that uh, the Sodom and Gomorrah story probably intends the same thing that they wanted to kill Lot as well as the strangers, uh, whereas they were stopped from it and, and paid for it by destruction in the Sodom story. Here they were stopped from killing the Levite, but not from killing the daughter, or the, the, the uh, concubine, and they do get theirs. They get pretty much wiped out in the war that follows this. Uh, so uh, here, uh, and, and one other thing about this, about how it was read. I mean, if, if this was based on the Sodom story, it's pretty obvious they didn't think the Sodom story was about killing uh, uh, they 
didn't think that the Sodom story was about the crowd wanting to gang rape Lot uh, or his his messengers, his guests, right? And uh, and the the third thing that's relevant here is a passage in uh, the book of Ezekiel. Uh, it's uh, Ezekiel. Oh, uh, boy, I need some better glasses here. Uh, Ezekiel sixteen forty nine. Let's see what that one says. Of course, I already know. Um, oh, let's see. Forty-nine, uh, six, no, I got the wrong page. Is it 49 through 50? I think it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her right. daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. Yeah, so if you're going to say what was the sin of Sodom uh, and you, you thought it was male homosexuality, it's an odd thing to leave out. Right here, they're, they're talking about mistreatment of fellow human beings, but it's the poor to whom they were indifferent. Uh, and so, again, that doesn't prove that it wasn't about homosexuality, but it seems to me, given the alarmed horror with which people read this, uh, uh, th because they think it's about homosexuality, it seems to me that the, the writer of Ezekiel didn't uh, even associate that with a story. Uh, what detestable things that they do well, well, could have been, well, he just told you, uh, but it also could have been uh, uh, worshiping other gods, which it elsewhere says in uh, Ezekiel, that that was a big sin of, of the Jerusalemites who he compares to the, the men of Sodom. So th this is why I change my mind on this, that it's it's not like this is explicitly about homosexuality one way or the other but suppose it was suppose it, they imagined the uh the men of sodom uh were did mean i'm sorry uh i suppose it was but suppose there the traditional reading is right that they wanted to gang rape uh the the men whom they don't realize are angels uh does that condemn homosexuality per se uh, not I unless you equate being gay with being a rapist, right? Uh, it's just like, I mean, there are plenty of, uh, regrettably, plenty of uh, uh, heterosexual rapists would just say, well, there you go. What do you expect from a heterosexual? It, it, you can easily see how ludicrous that is. But uh, people just make this sweeping general generalization here, and uh, it's it just shows how people don't think about this. Um, let me uh, jump over quick uh, to Leviticus, uh, where there are two very famous passages that are not narrative in nature, but uh, are laws uh, given in the so-called holiness code of Leviticus. Are you talking um, about Leviticus twenty thirteen? Yes, and uh, 1822. They're pretty much the same, but one has a price tag on it. In 1822, it says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Uh, what? Um, and then similarly, 23, You shall not lie with any beast and defile yourself with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to a beast to lie with it. It is perversion. And then the the uh, the twin passage uh, is uh, Leviticus 20, 13. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Uh, now, what is an abomination? Uh, here's another thing people just read right by. Uh, abomination, the, the English word, really translates uh, a word, a Hebrew word meaning confusion or mixture. And when you look at the big context of this, what you have is uh, a bunch of laws that don't 
deal immediately with morality. That's why adultery is not addressed here. That would be, you know, betrayal of your spouse. That that would be a moral uh, sin. But this is a, a ceremonial one. Uh, when it says that a man may not have sex with a man or an animal, uh, you're dealing with a whole different thing. This is uh, this is quote wrong for the same reason that it said it says in the same book you can't eat pork, you can't eat lobster. What the heck? What what's wrong with them? Uh, well, uh, this that they had a taxonomy, right? A, a, a system of classification of animals that was the basis for the kosher laws. Uh, they said that uh, if an animal did not uh, meet the criteria to be classified as um, livestock that, that you could slaughter and eat, you you couldn't eat it. It's off limits. And why were pigs off limits? Why weren't they on the menu? Well, because to be cattle or livestock, a creature had to have two things. Uh, it had to have cloven hooves and it had to chew the cud. That is, you know, chew the grass and digest it in one stomach and it comes back up. You chew it again, it goes to another stomach and even a series of stomachs. Uh, and Pigs don't do that, right? And so the you couldn't eat a pig. It it defied the categories of God's creation. Similarly, with a with a shrimp or a lobster, a crustacean, uh, it does it lives in the water, but it doesn't count as a fish, which you could eat because fish uh, swim through the water with fins. But crustaceans don't. They drag themselves across the bottom of the sea with legs. And so uh, you might think fish, but no. Seafood, yes, but not on the menu. Uh, now, how, how could these things, if God created them, how could they defy the categories of creation? Well, actually, there's a weird but simple answer to that. They borrowed this from Zoroastrianism, uh, and the Zoroastrians believed that Ahura Mazda, the good creator god, had not created nasty little things like snakes, scorpions, uh, termites, spiders, and all that. Uh, and uh, so they, were, they wouldn't eat them. Well, that's how they, the ancient Israelites got it. They, they borrowed it from them. And so they said, well, uh, you're, you, you're confounding the categories of creation uh, because God didn't create these. So you have no business eating them. Well, you see, that has nothing to do with morality or even of hygiene. Right. It's it's simply a matter of uh, observing the taxonomy. It's like anthropology, but it was sacred taxonomy. Oh, hey, God drew this up. We better. Of course, the priests drew it up. We, we got to obey it. So it was like a, a ceremonial infraction. Uh, it was like offering uh, food to idols or uh, or not uh, wa washing your hands after touching uh, a running sore or a corpse. Like the doctors would become ritually unclean after treating a patient, and they would have to go through a purification uh, rite before they could socialize again or go to the temple. It wasn't that they didn't want them um, fixing up the injured. No, they had to have that. Or morticians. If you touched a corpse, you were rendered unclean. But of course, you had to do that. You had to bury the dead. Uh, but you had to go through this extra ritual because if you didn't and you had supper or something, you were, you were uh, violating the ritual command. Now, all of that to say that homosexuality is mentioned here as an abomination. It, it defies the, the categories. They figured, well, uh, you know, we created them male and female, and uh, that's why a man shall cleave to his wife and it's that you see it's it's like 
uh, Jerry Falwell used to say, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Uh, well, yeah, that's, uh, that was the thinking. Uh, oh, can't do that. Uh, there are uh, certain um, pairings that are legitimate, in this case by marriage. You can overcome the, the category boundary there. But uh, mostly you can't. For instance, pederasty. Uh, you can't do that because that would you would be violating the wall between adults and children, uh, you, and or the bestiality thing. Hey, you you can't start getting cozy with an animal. I mean, physically it's possible, but uh, it, it's against the uh, the categories of creation. And so, uh, all of that to say, homosexuality, though clearly forbidden, right? No question about that in in Leviticus. Why is it, and is it relevant to uh, Bible-believing Christians today? Uh, I would say it is not. It's like uh, how Paul says, hey, look, you're in the New Covenant. You, you don't need to worry about the holy, stipulated holy days and dietary regulations and fasting. And I'll, Don't let anybody bother you with that stuff if you're a Gentile Christian. Well, it's the same thing here, I think. Uh, it's not commanding you to do it, but if you're in the New Testament, the New Covenant, this doesn't apply any more than uh, you can't eat shrimp, it seems to me. And so there again, it's clear exegetically what it says, uh, but it isn't hermeneutically. It's not clear how duty-bound Christians have to take this seriously, and I don't think they do. I mean, again, it's nothing to me because I'm not a biblicist anymore. Uh, but those, even those who are, I think, don't really need to lose any sleep over that one. Um, and, uh, you know, who's going to know this? Uh, this is why you have geeks like me to uh, study these crazy things. Uh, uh, now, let's jump over to the New Testament, and this can be done much more quickly. Uh, there are two similar passages that uh, where where translators kind of cheat uh, and and read homosexuality per se into them, uh, and I think uh, it's it's quite dubious. Now the first one would be uh, in First Corinthians, and uh, this is. Ooh, I thought I marked this. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Six, nine uh, through 11. You betcha. Oh, prophetic one. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, I, I just, no, no. Hey, I know the Bible. I mean, I know the Bible back and forth. Right. Um, uh, yeah, it says, do not, uh, uh, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, and so on, will inherit the kingdom of God. Is that what it says in the Greek? No, it ain't. Uh, the footnote in the RSV says, well, actually, two Greek words lie behind uh, what we translated as homosexuals. But the two words, I'm sorry, were you about to, to explain this? I don't want to. No, no, I was, you're doing fantastic. I was about to say you're exactly right. That's not what it says in the Greek. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, the two words are arsenokoitai, uh, which comes from the roots uh, for man and bed, meaning uh, either. Uh, it, it seems to denote either a male prostitute or a, a customer of a male prostitute, one who beds men in a sexual sense. But we're not sure because there are so few known instances of the word arsenokoitai in surviving ancient Greek literature that we just have to try to break it down uh, lexically to those roots. And so it's, it pretty much has to mean one or the other of the things, uh, like a, a male prostitute or one who is a, a John of such a person. Um, what, but we don't know which. Either In either case, you're not talking about homosexuality, period. Uh, it's, uh, it's conceivable that's what he meant, but it's certainly not clear, especially since the other Greek word is malakoi, which means soft ones. I think King James and uh, 
translates that effeminate. Well, they're closer to the mark there because that uh, that also is a rare word, uh, but it seems to refer to catamites, uh, the prettied up uh, young boys who are are prostitutes, call boys, are sometimes referred to. Now, if that's what you're talking about, you're not talking about all homosexuals, right? You're simply talking about a kind of prostitution, which is not very surprising in the Bible, right? Uh, and the other one easily dealt with is First Timothy, uh, uh, chapter one, verses. Uh, who? Uh, who? Wait a minute. Well, yeah, okay, Eight through eleven. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, Im uh, immoral persons, um, sodomites, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine and so forth. Uh, the, uh, the, the kidnappers, that apparently refers to a particular kind of kidnapper, namely uh, people that, uh, well, just like what's happening, thanks to Biden, in, in, with our open border, uh, sex trafficking of children. Uh, that's what they're talking about. They, they, or what they, they call chicken hawks uh, today. That uh, where you you grab young kids and and force them to to be pederastic prostitutes. But then sodomites in this. Uh, that uh, again is our old friend arsenokoitai. And so the same ambiguity exists there. Do they mean prostitutes uh, or uh, customers of prostitutes? Uh, you don't know. And I, I always think this matters because can you imagine a, uh, a, a fundamentalist preacher railing against homosexuals saying, brothers and sisters, the Bible possibly condemns homosexuality. There's a 55% chance that God hates someone. No, they're not going to do that. Uh, they don't look at it that deeply. And uh, it, it just, you, you can't thunder forth on things that are not even clear in the Bible. Uh, and uh, that's because people want to be able to do that. They want to speak as if they were God. Well, the last one uh, is Romans. Uh, in uh, chapter 1, um, Paul, or whoever wrote this, is, uh, is uh, going into why the human race became sinful. Uh, and it was because they became polytheists and idolaters, turning away from the real God, etc., etc. Uh, in uh, 126 through 27, it says, for this reason, this is why, uh, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Uh, their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural. Uh, what does that mean? Well, uh, does that mean lesbianism? I don't think so. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, he seems to have the Levitical code in mind. I think it refers to bestiality, because that because lesbianism is never mentioned in the Bible, whereas women having sex with animals, <laughs> oh boy, is. Then 27, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Not quite sure what the last part means, but okay, that does seem to be a blanket condemnation uh, of male homosexuality. But uh, what, which Leviticus does uh, condemn, but what is it predicated on? Uh, he says they're going against their nature. Well, uh, gays would say, hey, if I have to force myself to have sex with a woman to whom I am not attracted, that's going against my nature. Uh, and and at, in their time, 
they uh, didn't seem to realize there was uh, such a thing as constitutional homosexuality, uh, that uh, you're, uh, you, you wake up to the fact that you're gay, sometimes with panic. You didn't choose it. Hey, this might be fun. What the heck? Uh, and uh, so it seems to me this is like uh, preach, teaching that you got to believe the sun orbits the earth because they thought so in Joshua, right? It's predicated on on uh, ignorance, and uh, you can't make the cultural mores of pre-scientific society binding on people in, in a scientific one. And so there again, we're not talking about exegesis, but hermeneutics. Yeah, I see what it says, but they're not taking to account that's the main issue uh so should you feel bound by this i don't think so i don't see how that, that seems unfair to me and uh unfair to the bible and to the, the homosexual um so uh it's so it seems to me what have we got what's the bottom line here there are some places where uh, homosexual, a precious few, where homosexuality is or might be uh, condemned, but it's predicated on an outdated view of, of the world and sexuality. But most of the places are either inapplicable because we're otherwise not bound by uh, the Levitical Holiness Code, where we we follow the Ten Commandments, right? But that's that's all moral stuff, except maybe for mm -hmm. the Sabbath, but uh, but not this stuff. Uh, and and then there's ambiguity that uh, vitiate any appeal to um, passages like the First Corinthians and First Timothy. So, uh, should a, uh, a a gay Christian um, shudder in horror at expressing himself in in the only way that that he he or well, let's say he because it's all about men mainly here in the bible uh the only way he can i, I don't think so i think that's cruel and legalistic now you might not want to be profligate uh, you might not want to have thousands of sex partners but that's this is one of those things where like uh, in first corinthians all things are lawful for me but not all things are expedient it's not smart for mm -hmm. various reasons but that's i don't think you can just say the bible condemns and forbids homosexuality it's a much more uh, ambiguous and nuanced matter than than that mm. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to our broadcast today with Wise as a Serpent with the Sage himself, Dr. Robert M. Price. This is Bishop Taylor signing off for today. Thank you so much, and have a good one. <laughs>